Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode 172 of the Medieval Podcast. I'm Danielle Savalsky, also known as the 5-Minute Medievalist. Just over five years ago on September 23rd, 2017, I gave a TEDx talk at TEDx Milton, which is a town just outside of Toronto. And I was talking about how we should look to the past and learn from it so that we can better face the challenges of today and the challenges of the future. And I thought, with this five-year anniversary just having passed, I thought this was a good opportunity to go back and look at this TED Talk again and think about the ways in which things have changed in the last five years, the things that I wasn't able to say in my 18 minutes. And do I think that any of the things I said at that time should be changed? So today I'm going to be revisiting my TED Talk. If you haven't seen it, that is perfectly okay. You are not going to get lost. Hopefully this will still give you some interesting things to think about when it comes to history and how it can influence us in the future. We'll be talking about my TED Talk, History in Three Dimensions, right after this. So back in September of 2017, I was about to give a TED Talk, and this was the most nervous I had ever been in my career. Actually, the most nervous I have been to this point <laughs> before and since. It is the most nervous I've ever been in my career because when you do a TED Talk, you only have 18 minutes, and you have to really stick strictly to that. They have a light that you have to look at that tells you, you know, you're running out of time, finish up. And then you have a red light that says when you have run out of time. So it's a little bit stressful when you're doing it. Plus, you have to actually stay static on that dot. And I'm a person that likes to move around when I'm talking. The other thing, of course, that makes a TED Talk really nerve wracking is if you do it right, if you do it well, and if it has the right combination of luck and circumstance, it can reach a whole lot of people. As it turned out, my video didn't get a million views, but that's okay. I was still proud of it. I was still happy that I had put something out there that I could be proud of that I think put across a message that I really believed in, which is that we should not dismiss the knowledge of the people in the past because it can be very useful to us when we're trying to solve current problems. TED is meant to be focused on science. It's meant to be focused on things that are immediately measurable. And sometimes that doesn't really lend itself to the humanities. And so that's where I was headed when I was coming up with it. I was really thinking about how is history relevant to us directly? Why should we care? Why should the people who are watching this care about history? So let's revisit the TED Talk and see what I think about it and whether things have changed since then. So the place I started for this talk was a place I often started in my career, whether that was talks or writing or things like that, and that was the flat earth thing. And I'm happy to say that over the past five years, there has been a shift. I think fewer people think that medieval people thought the earth was flat, although that is still a persistent myth that I think we are all working against. I was certainly one of the people that was taught that medieval people thought the earth was flat in school. And I think that people in school perhaps are not learning that these days. I don't know that for sure. I don't have any statistics, but I think that there is a shift when people say overtly ridiculous stuff on Twitter. It often gets shouted down by experts and just ordinary people who find these myths really irritating. So I'm happy to say that I think the flat earth myth is starting to go away, at least when it applies to the Middle Ages. I know there are still flat earthers out there. I don't know that we can do anything about that, but I think overall that myth is starting to dissipate. One of the things I also started with to show that people realized that the earth was round was that picture from Westminster Abbey with Richard II who's holding an orb. And then I showed some manuscript pictures that show the spherical earth. But you know what? I've had people who I know and love who have watched my TED Talk and seen this evidence and still believe medieval people thought the earth was flat. So <laughs> you can only do your best in this world. One of the things I mentioned in this is that the ancient Greeks had calculated the circumference of the earth using geometry. And I had footnotes for this talk, but they don't end up on YouTube. So this is based on the calculations of Eratosthenes, who said that the circumference of the Earth was 40,000 kilometers. And since that time, NASA has measured and it estimates that the circumference of the Earth is actually 40,070 kilometers, which is incredibly close. Using the tools that they had in ancient Greece, this is an amazing feat to be able to calculate the circumference of the Earth so closely. I still think that is amazing. 
But one of the things that I mentioned in the TED Talk is that our brains are pretty much the same as they were 3,000 years ago. So if there is something that we can figure out now, we were probably able to figure it out then. It's just our tools were different. And the amount of information we can exchange over time and space is different, but our hardware is still basically the same. And an example that I used, because you need to throw in jokes during this kind of thing, was that in this 3,000 years we're talking about Western civilization, back to the ancient Greeks, men still have nipples. So, I mean... It's true. We've evolved in some ways, I think, but only in very small ways. Our brains are basically the same. But one of the images I used in the TED Talk was saying we think about progress. We think of it as a straight line, like going up on a graph, and we are at the pinnacle of evolution. And I think when we think about progress, that actual graph would be probably pretty squiggly when we go a few steps forward, we go back, and then we go forward, and then we go back. Hopefully, we are changing and evolving, but it's not a given that we are smarter. Our brains are pretty much the same as they have been for thousands of years. So that is something that I I still stand by. And one of the things I mentioned to sort of drive home this point was that I think that if you brought someone forward from ancient Greece or from the Middle Ages, and you gave them a smartphone, it wouldn't take them long to figure it out and be able to use it as well as we can. It might take a longer learning curve because you have to explain things like cellular signals and Wi-Fi and that kind of stuff, but they would still be able to use it and use it effectively. And I love to see in that cheesy Christmas movie, The Night Before Christmas, they bring forward a medieval knight in time. And he learns how to do things like drive a car and use the TV. And I really think that that is actually a brilliant part of a very cheesy movie, showing that people are smart and they continue to be smart. And we really need to give them the credit that they deserve for their smarts, the people of the past. So then I come to my main thesis, which is basically if we want to solve the big issues that we are facing right now, we should look back at the past and see how they solved similar issues because many of the challenges that we face today were faced back in the day as well. So how did people deal with them back then? If we learn from this, we will have a leg up. That's my idea. It's something I still believe in. And hopefully you do too if you're listening to this podcast. So how did I come at this? Well, I started with a book called Bald's Leech Book, which is a collection of medical recipes. And you know how I love medical recipes. This one had a whole bunch of stuff in it. Some of it sounds really ridiculous. One of the things I pulled out was that you should cure madness by whipping someone with a porpoise skin. And of course, that sounds ridiculous and it is ridiculous. But having lived through COVID to this point, I can't really say that we have evolved in this sense either because some of the cures that we've used or that people have used to try and stop COVID have been ridiculous. So, you know, it's not all that strange that this kind of thing ends up in Bob's Leech Bug. But I brought this up because one of the stories that made a lot of headlines just before 2017 was that there's a recipe pulled from Bob's Leech Book that was created and it ended up being able to kill a superbug called MRSA. Now, I pulled this one out because it had been replicated in a couple of studies. But since that time, I've heard a few medievalists say that this is perhaps a misreading of that recipe, but I couldn't find that work. So, I mean, don't quote me on that, but some medievalists have said that perhaps the way that this recipe was interpreted was maybe not correct. At the time, when I was doing this TED Talk, there wasn't all that much scientific research in relative terms on medieval cures and how they might work in the modern world. And there's been a lot more done since then. So we have people who are looking at the chemical properties of things like chamomile or mint or mulberry. And these things are actually being used and experimented with so that we can find out their efficacy. And actually a lot of medieval herbal remedies have quite a lot of efficacy to a point. So things like mulberry are helpful for burns, something that I have in the monk book, my book about monks. Mulberry was used to help heal burns in rat trials and things like chamomile were used to reduce infection So there are a lot of plants that have antibacterial properties, but we're only learning about this now. In 2017, the MRSA thing was making headlines. It was worth talking about. Even if 
since that time, there has been a bit of doubt thrown upon it. I think it was still worth talking about in 2017. A couple of the other examples that I gave in the TED Talk were peat moss, which sometimes has antibacterial properties. You could pack wounds with that, and people were doing that up until World War I. And then we have willow bark, which is one of my favorite things. That's got acetosalicylic acid in it, which is basically aspirin. So I still think we should look to medieval recipes and see, dig around, see what's possible in there. One of the things I had to just throw out in my 18 minutes and I didn't get to elaborate on, which I can do now, is that people used electric eels for shock therapy. So this comes from Vivian Nutton's book, Ancient Medicine, and there was an ancient Roman called Scribonius Largus from the early first century who suggested in his book that you can use an electric ray or a torpedo fish to help you cure migraines. And I think the idea behind it is that if you keep getting stung, it's going to get rid of your migraine. I don't know if it's the type of thing where if you distract someone with a pain somewhere else, they forget about the pain in another spot. But it's very interesting that they used an electric fish to figure this out. So in case you wanted to know more about this shock therapy thing in ancient Rome, this is from Vivian Nutton's book, Ancient Medicine. And I still think it is a cool little nugget. Then I moved on to the fact that in the Middle Ages, people usually had a prayer or an incantation that went with a remedy. And then people are studying now the effects of meditation, prayer, and positive thinking on healing. That's ongoing work in the scientific community, but it's fascinating. So it's interesting, I think, to see how prayers and medicine are working together in the Middle Ages. And I really think this is a fascinating area of study that is continuing on today. Then, of course, I talked about leeches and maggots. I think that leeches are something that we are familiar with. People talk about leeches in medicine a fair amount. Leeches help, of course, to drain off blood, which can reduce swelling, and that's always very helpful. Leech is also the word in Old English for doctor because leeches were really useful to doctors at the time. And then the other thing I talked about is maggots. And the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, something I mentioned in the TED Talk, actually has leeches and maggots registered as medical devices, living medical devices. So this was fascinating because revisiting this, I found a new book from 2022, The Complete Guide to Maggot Therapy by Frank Stadler. So if you are really interested in maggot therapy, there is a complete guide now as of 2022. And what people have found is that maggots will eat the necrotic tissue of a wound. And this is not just any maggots, right? You can't just pick them up off the ground and throw them in your wound. Do not do that. These are the maggots of the green bottle fly. And what they've found is that you have a quicker healing rate, that people need fewer antibiotics, and there is a decreased amputation risk, and these little maggots actually have antimicrobial secretions as part of their work. So in case you were fascinated, you had listened to the TED Talk and were fascinated by maggots, there you go. You can go and look up the complete guide to maggot therapy now and learn everything you want. I actually talked about this at the zombie apocalypse medicine meeting, which happens at Arizona State University every two years, and I'll be talking at it again this year. And somebody asked in the question and answer period, do we just need giant maggots to help us fight the zombies? And that might actually be the solution. The only problem with that being that you would have absolutely massive green bottle flies flying around. Is that better than zombies? I don't know. I will leave that up to you. One of the things that I just kind of passed over, again, this is an 18-minute talk that I'm doing. There's not much depth I can get into really, when I'm trying to sort of give an overview of how history can help us, is that when people wrote down stuff like these medical recipes, when they started to record information, they were doing that not just because they like to write, because their fingers needed exercise on the quill. It's because they wanted to make life better for us. And I think we don't really give them enough credit and we don't give them enough gratitude. They're recording this information for our sake, not just the sake of the people who they know who might be reading it, but for the people in future generations who might need this information. This is people reaching out for connection to us. And I really think we should be grateful and we should give them credit for that. And I didn't talk about that all that much in the TED Talk, but there you go. I really do think that we should be grateful 
to people who are actually taking the time to record this stuff for us, the people of the future. So then in the talk, I moved on to the Black Death because you cannot talk about the Middle Ages without talking about the Black Death. And actually, the Black Death is instructive always in teaching us about disasters. And it has become super relevant, obviously, in the past couple of years. The amount of work that's been done on the Black Death in the last five years has been immense. It's been really fantastic work tracing the DNA of Yersinia pestis, really amazing stuff. And of course, if you want to learn more about the Black Death, always go to Monica Green's academia.edu page where she has bibliographies that will help you learn more about it. And you can listen to Winston Black talking about the Black Death here on the podcast a couple of years ago, just when COVID was first rearing its head. So when I start talking about the Black Death, I mention a couple of things that people thought might work, smelling flowers, for example. And I say that if you were in the midst of the Black Death, you would try anything to survive. And this is 2017. This is when the idea of a worldwide pandemic was kind of forgotten, the AIDS pandemic, mostly forgotten, I think, by people. And the idea of COVID was not even on the radar. But I still think this is perhaps the most right (laughs) I was in the entire talk, that people will try just about anything to survive. And I think we saw that. So, I mean, this is one place where I think we can really connect to the people of the past and understand them better and maybe give them more grace than we did in the time that I gave this talk. Having seen what we've seen with COVID, people really do do just about anything to survive when they feel immediately threatened. The aftermath, I mean, that's a whole different discussion. But in those first few weeks and months of COVID, we saw the most incredible range of potential remedies. A lot of them ridiculous, but people were desperate. And so when we cast our minds back to the Black Death, this is something that perhaps we might have more sympathy for when we see people who are carrying posies, perhaps, or flogging. One of the things I mentioned when I'm talking about the Black Death is that people used medicine and they also prayed. And I think that is something that you did see or we do see when it comes to COVID. People are taking medicine and they're also appealing to God. And that is something that you'd see anytime in history. And it's something that is perhaps more personal to us now. There's a quote that I gave in this I pulled out about French doctors during the plague. And that quote was, this does not mean forsaking doctors for the most high created earthly medicine. And although God alone cures the sick, he does so through the medicine which in his generosity he has provided. And I'm pulling this quote out again just to give it credit. It's from Faith Wallace's Medieval Medicine, A Reader, which is a really great book. The next point I came at was the fact that When people were looking at the Black Death, one of the things that they did look at was, what was the climate like just before the Black Death? Does this have anything to do with it? And while people who are writing in the medieval world don't have access quickly to all of the information that's happening globally, they were looking to see, are there any environmental disasters that might have started it? And I think this was wise and something that we should give them credit for also, because I think we are learning that climate change was one of the things that disrupted the marmot population and really made it possible for the Black Death to spread. And with climate change going on right now, this is kind of the point I'm making in the TED Talk and will still make, will forever make, with climate change upon us, we really need to pay attention to the patterns between disruptions in the climate and what's happening in terms of disease. So this is something, again, I think we can really relate to something we can learn from that connects us back to history. And there's a quote that I pulled out there from ancient Greek. This is actually from Hippocrates, who said, a year of many fogs and damps is a year of many illnesses. And I mentioned this is something that modern kindergarten teachers can attest to. And it's true. It's always important to pay attention to weather and how it affects us. Because, of course, as humans, we are part of a global ecosystem. It's not something that we can avoid. So this is something that's happening in the Middle Ages And it's still important paying attention to how the climate is changing and how that affects us in terms of disease. Rounding out the section on the Black Death, I said that the more we study the Black Death, the more we can be prepared for outbreaks of epidemic disease. (laughs) Looking back on that, 
it's something looking back on that. I think we kind of did learn from the Black Death and its spread, and we kind of didn't. I don't want to get too much into a COVID response today, but I do want to say that people like Monica Green are working tirelessly to help us make connections between previous pandemics and this one and how we can move forward. So history is very important, I think, when it comes to learning about pandemics and helping us prepare. I still think we can learn from the Black Death to prepare better for the next one. But that's all I'm going to say on COVID response based on what we knew from the Black Death. So then I moved on to robots. And perhaps robots are not something that you think about when you think about history. But actually, people have been creating mechanized robots for millennia. And one of the ones I pulled out was a guy called Monkbot. He lives in the Smithsonian now, and he's a clockwork monk that was meant to roll around and greet people. There are some videos on the internet you can see Monkbot actually in motion. He's very creepy when he's in motion. But the fact that he exists, this mechanized robot, is really interesting to me. What I was getting at in bringing up robots and the fact that they are created to look like us, which is something that people were doing in the Middle Ages. I wrote about robot saints for Medievalist.net, lo, these many years. But what I was getting at was the fact that we are always thinking as humans about what is it that makes us human. So there's philosophical debates about this all the time. And they were raging in the Middle Ages, these philosophical debates about what makes us human. So these were mostly applied to animals back in the day. But the questions people were asking were things like, who has a soul? And when do they get a soul? And what is a soul made of? And as I was talking about with Meg Leah just a couple of weeks ago, where does the soul actually sit in the body? And we can apply these ideas, these ways of thinking about what makes us human to current debates about AI, because we are still building robots. And we are building robots that look more like us than ever, and they act more like us than ever. I was just reading about something the other day. Somebody is trying to train AI to laugh at jokes and to laugh the right amount and at the right moment at jokes that people are telling. So as these robots become more human, it's interesting and important to revisit these debates about what makes something sentient. I mean, that's what Westworld is all about. Westworld hadn't been redone in 2017. Of course, there was the old one from the 70s, which I watched back in the day. But the idea of what is sentient, what makes us a person is something that's still going on today. People are talking about this in terms of marine life, for example. Is an octopus sentient? Is an orca sentient? And what does this mean when we are putting them in zoos, for example? So I still think this is an important debate and a place where we need to keep looking back at the past. That hasn't changed. My thinking around this hasn't changed at all in five years. In fact, as we keep moving forward in terms of AI, I think it becomes more relevant to try and figure out, even if we don't end up coming to a full agreement, figuring out what is it that makes us human? And so how do we relate to AI as it's coming up, as it's becoming more sophisticated? So then I moved on to classic practical wisdom, little nuggets from the past, things like don't drink and make decisions, be careful who you get involved with, that kind of stuff, how to take care of your body and mind. I ended up writing an entire book about this called How to Live Like a Monk. So if you want to really learn more about what the Middle Ages can tell us about practical wisdom, I mean, read that book. But there are classic nuggets of wisdom that are always relevant, continually relevant. Of course, I believe this. It's in the monk book. I think the only thing that has changed in my thinking about this whole section is that in the past, the wisdom that was coming out of indigenous elders was really discounted even in 2017, only five years ago. And I think that since that time, Indigenous wisdom has started to gain some ground that people are starting to look at the stories that were passed down and start to find that it's valuable information. They're starting to look at Indigenous recipes and cures and start to take them more seriously, like the recipes from the Middle Ages. That is ground that we have gained as humans 
in the last five years, and I'm happy to see this happening, and I hope it happens some more because just because something is an oral culture doesn't mean that it is worthless. Obviously, people in the Americas, indigenous people have been learning and coming up with solutions and cures for thousands of years. That wisdom is obviously important, and I'm happy to see some ground being gained in giving it the respect it deserves. So then I start to round the corner near the end, start to come up to my conclusions as, you know, these lights are starting to shine in my face, showing that I'm running out of time for my TED Talk. Coming to the end of this, the point that I really am making is that when we listen to our friends and relatives, when they speak, perhaps they come up with some crazy ideas, but we listen to them. And then we decide whether we want to follow their advice or not. And I think that when it comes to history, we often dismiss what people said back in the day. Not you podcast listeners, because obviously you're here for a reason. But in general, people dismiss the stuff from the past because they think we've evolved past it. And I really think that we should listen to what our ancestors and elders have to say And then we can decide whether we want to use that information or not. But I do think that we need to pay more attention to what has been written. Pay attention to history. Again, preaching to the choir, I know that you are here because you find this valuable. But this is something that was really at the heart of what I was trying to get across. And I still think it's really important, perhaps more important than ever before, because so many of the challenges we're facing are huge and wide ranging and global. So I still believe that we should be learning from history, obviously, that's why I do the work I do. And this is really what I'm coming to at the end of this talk. Just before the end, I mentioned that we have to be careful of our words. When we talk about the past, we should avoid using words like superstitious or primitive. This is a problem we still have. Even when people are talking about things from the past being useful or helpful, they still use words like superstitious and primitive in media. And I think these are words we should catch ourselves before we say. That's something I think is just ingrained habit. In some ways, we are starting to pay more attention to the past, but we still have these ingrained habits of thinking of people from the past as being dumber than us. And I think this is something that we can fix in a small way if we start paying attention to our terminology. So at that point, I came to the end of my TED Talk and said we should learn from the past to give ourselves a bright future. And of course, I still believe in that. So overall, this TED Talk holds up pretty well. One of the things that I think has changed in the five years since I did this TED Talk is that there is perhaps a better understanding of the Middle Ages, or at least a desire to understand the Middle Ages better. So when people are posting stuff that is overtly ridiculous on social media, for example, they are being corrected by a lot of people. And hopefully gently, if you're one of the people that is doing the correcting, I hope that you're doing it gently because we don't know things until we learn them. So I'm all about learning and doing it in a way that is gentle and friendly. So if you're doing the correcting, please do it gently. People don't know what they don't know. But I do think that people are starting to want to understand the Middle Ages on its own terms. This is something that is a struggle. I mean, we've probably all seen the trailer for the new movie that's just called Medieval, which is all of the stereotypes that I work very hard against. So this isn't a universal transition, but I do think that there is movement towards understanding the Middle Ages on its own terms a little bit better. So looking back on this talk I did five years ago and was so nervous about doing I still think it holds up. There are a lot of things that we can learn from history that we can apply to these problems that seem ultra-modern, problems like pandemic disease and climate change and AI. And I think those people in the past that were writing to help us, we should take them up on their offer, learn from them, and see what it teaches us, see where we can go from there. And in the last five years, I'm so happy to see that happening more and more, that humanities and the sciences are collaborating to see what we can learn and what we can apply to these big and challenging problems. So whether you've seen the TED Talk or not, I hope that you enjoyed this episode and that it stirred up a whole bunch of ideas about how we can use historical information to help us solve current and future problems. 
Before we go, here's Peter from Medievalist.net to tell us what's on the website. What's new this week, Peter? Hey, hey. Well, I guess we have a little sad news to start off with. Hilary Mantel has just passed away. Yeah. She is very famous uh, as a historical novelist. Wolf Hall is set in the Tudor era, talking about Thomas Cromwell, part of a trilogy she wrote. That's who she's most famous for, but she's a really well-respected author. So it's very sad to hear her go. Mm Mm-hmm. I know that everyone loved her books, so it is a sad, a sad moment, and I think a little bit unexpected. So she will be missed. Mm-hmm. Right on the website right now, I'm working on this kind of weird piece about the Genoese going to Baghdad in the early 1290s. There was a scheme by the uh, Mongols that ruled from Baghdad to bring 700 Genoese sailors there to build a couple of ships galleys so they could take over the Indian Ocean. That is a big project. Yes. The references are very scattered, but it it seems that they wound up killing themselves in kind of a Ghibelline versus Guelph feud (laughs) that they brought over from Italy. So the the plan came to nothing, but I'm always really interested in this little bit because I've heard little bits about it, but I've tracked down basically all the sources and there are just little snippets of information. So I'm trying to have that by the time this podcast comes out. <laughs> this is a story I do not know. So it's going to be interesting seeing that article come together. Indeed, indeed. Well, so we have on the website, we have uh, Nick Morton talking about mercenaries in the Middle East. Also, we have a really good piece from Adam Alley kind of explaining how medieval Arabic names work. If you've read Arabic works, you'll find their names are really long, six or seven kind of pieces to their name. So he tries to explain the meanings of it, like why, you know, some are based on lineage, uh, some places are, are where you are, some are kind of like nicknames. So he lays all that out to give you a guide. So I thought that was a really cool piece. So that's coming out by the time this podcast is out. That's super important because those names are meant to give you a lot of information. So it's great that you're going to have an article that will help people decode this information if they're not familiar with it. So that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. So lots of fun stuff coming on the website. Well, thanks, Peter. We will have to check those out. Thanks. A big thank you, as always, goes out to everyone who supports this podcast through Medievalist.net's page at Patreon.com. Patrons can enjoy subscriptions to the Medieval Magazine and Medieval World Magazine, as well as ad-free versions of Medievalist.net and this podcast. Your patronage supports my work and the work of others who contribute amazing content to Medievalist.net, so thank you. To become a patron, check out Patreon.com slash Medievalists. For everything from Ted to Beds, follow Medievalist.net on Facebook or Twitter at Medievalists. You can find me, Danielle Sobalski, on social media at 5MIN Medievalist or 5 Minute Medievalist. And you can find my books at all your favorite bookstores, where you can get hold of How to Live Like a Monk, Medieval Wisdom for Modern Life in hardcover, ebook, and audiobook. You can also find my new digital downloads at daniellesobalski.com slash shop. Our music is Beyond the Warriors by Geefrog. Thanks for listening, and have yourself a fantastic day. <laughs>